Doctors of Reddit, what patient made you go how the frick are you even alive? Belligerent guy comes in, in a wheelchair. He doesn't want to be here. He's freaking fine. The party was good. Ems. Fricked his evening up. Ems brought him in from a bush party. The guy had a chainsaw stuck in his thigh and shin. Literally jammed in his leg. And severe burns after falling into the bonfire on half his body. Guy was hammered. Didn't seem bothered by the fact he was severely burned or had a chainsaw in his leg. He ended up losing the leg below his knee. And got a nasty infection from the burn. But still. If his leg wasn't completely fricked. I am convinced he'd have gotten up and tried to fight people. He must be an Aussie, and I can tell you, almost 100% certain, if he is Australian. He was drinking Bundy rum. That crap makes you do funny things. I still drink it though. I was on home call for her in a small town. Got a call from the nurse one night and she was like Ems brought someone in here and they think she might be dead. I was like, well, is she she was like I don't know. This was a seasoned RN by the way, so I was like, well, guess we're treating this as a code blue kind of situation. So without any further information, I jump into my car and rush over to the hospital. Once I got there, I realized why the Tridge nurse was so confused. In the trauma bay, lay what appeared to be skeletonized remains under a blanket. The person felt warm to touch, so I opened their eye, and a yellow, wrinkled, Shrunk an eyeball stared at me and then suddenly moved. Potassium of 1. For those familiar with lab values. The backstory was extreme self neglect depression combined with caregiver neglect. Weighed in at 67 pounds at a height of about 5 feet 5 inches. We actually resuscitated her. Very aggressively. And unbelievably. After about 8 liters of fluid. She started speaking a word or two at a time and recognized her daughter. For those like me who are curious. Potassium levels of 3.65.2 is normal. Anything less than 2.5 is life threatening. Seems like a relatively wide range for normal, but it doesn't take much to get into deadly territory. That's kind of scary. I'm going to go eat a banana. Patient here. When I was 2 I was being treated for asthma due to wheezing, lab or breathing, etc. One night it got exceptionally bad so my mom took me to the air. They put me face down to do a CT scan. This was 1990, and when they were done, they turned me back over and I was blue. Had stopped breathing. CT revealed a volleyball size mass in my chest. Emergency surgery revealed what was supposed to be my twin. It kept growing inside my rib cage and finally had nowhere to go in my toddler body so it cut off my airway. It had fingernails, hair, appendages, everything but major organs. I made a full recovery. I am a healthy 31 year old now. Zero asthma. Only remnant of that night is a scar that goes from the center of my chest to the center of my back. Update. Definitely didn't expect this to blow up. Dang. This was a teratoma, so it was never a viable human. What the frick? A couple pictures of me before and after brain surgeries were on the front page around this time last year. The mortality rate for acute subdural hematomas is 50-90%. Of those who live, approximately 20-30% regain any brain functioning. Due to the subdural hematoma, the bleeding in my skull was so severe that I also had cranial herniation. My brain tilted 5 millimeters, causing my brain stem to compress into my spinal cord. That I not only lived, but woke up, and recovered well enough to go back to work get married travel the world return to baseline physically is a straight up medical miracle. I'm still in touch with the neurosurgeon who was on call at the hospital that day, and he says the same thing. Whoa, I went back through your posts and I'm all choked up. That's amazing. I'm sorry you had to endure something so horrible, but so thankful you could overcome it. Congratulations on your recovery and marriage. I hope things will continue to be positive. Lady in her mid 30s was in the clinic for a one week follow up post foot amputation. Diabetes. She was admitted straight from the clinic because her blood glucose was 600 mgdl. Normal is 8120, and the wound was severely infected. We used super concentrated doses of insulin to bring it back to the 200s. She was on strict diet restrictions and we couldn't figure out how it wouldn't drop any lower than 250. Turns out her kids, teens, 
had been sneaking giant 64 ounces sodas and candy bars into the hospital, literally one week after we chopped her foot off because of uncontrolled diabetes. Not exactly a case of how the frick did you survive that trauma disease but how the frick do you even function on your own? I know a guy who keeps telling me that he never takes insulin and drinks 40 ounces of dew a day and his diabetes hasn't caused him any problems yet. Same guy also had his foot amputated a few inches above the ankle a year ago. Currently a med student, but was formerly in a nurse. While working as a nurse I had this one patient who was originally from the Congo complaining of right lower abdominal pain, with a subsequent diagnosis of appendicitis. Nothing crazy about that, see it every day. The crazy part was the story he told me next. He said that he didn't think it could be appendicitis, and when I asked him why he told me this, when he was in the Congo, he was out in the bush trying to poach gorillas, awful, I know, when he developed right lower abdominal pain, nausea, fever etc, being out in the bush, far from medical attention, he and his buddy decided the best course of action was to cut open his abdomen with a machete and remove his own freaking appendix. After nearly dying from the surgery, he then went on to nearly die from sepsis over the next several weeks. I assume he was under medical care by this point. Somehow, he manages to overcome nearly impossible odds and survives and years later immigrated to Canada where he develops appendicitis. Again. So after hearing this I was equally amazed as well as skeptical. But he showed me his scar which I thought was fairly validating. I told his surgeon the story and asked why would he still get appendicitis. And they said he most likely just didn't remove the whole thing. I know this is all hearsay and it is definitely possible it was exaggerated or even entirely fabricated by the patient. But if it's true, it's one of the most badass things I've ever heard and definitely belongs here. Seems possible. There's a cosplayer named Nightmage who was hospitalized for appendicitis twice last year. First surgery was uneventful, but apparently part of his appendix decided to go walkabout only to blow up again a few months later. Not a doctor, but I had a few doctors ask me that. Typically, if you get appendicitis it'll rupture and sepsis will set in within a day or so. And when that happens, it gets real bad real fast. So I got appendicitis. It freaking hurt so bad, but I didn't know I had appendicitis. I went to the doctor, he couldn't tell what was going on. He though I had compacted stool and wanted me to take stool softeners. So I did. It didn't help. Cause spoiler, it was appendicitis, right? And then a roommate who thinks he knows what he's talking about tells me that it's all in my head and I just need to physically get off the couch and exercise, because he feels much better after he exercises. Okay dude, I can't even get off the couch to use the restroom without almost passing out in pain. He tells me to just play a video game to get my mind off of it. I go to class, grad student at the time. I call the doctor and make another appointment. He doesn't know what's going on. I talk with another doctor. No clue, he thought maybe it's appendicitis. But I didn't have a fever and didn't have a recoil pain. So maybe it was gastrointestinal stuff. So I schedule an appointment, meet with them. All the while I'm going to class and taking the maximum dosage of all pain relievers I can get my hands on. And finally, finally the GI doctor's scan showed that I had appendicitis. Hooray. I go to the nearest eye and I say, in a totally calm tone, Hi, my name is, insert name here. So, my doctor said I should probably go to the ear because my appendix burst a while ago and it should probably be taken out or something. But turns out, my appendix burst and I held onto it for three and a half weeks. I had a dozen doctors come in, and some of them even started by saying, Hello, my name is Dr. Such and Such, and I heard that you're the guy who has had a burst appendix for nearly a month and you're still alive. I am not on your case. But I just wanted to meet you. How the heck are you still alive? How the heck did you drive yourself here and just waltz into our... Uh, I got that alien bioengineering upgrade where the abdomen moves around and wall seals off the burst appendix so it doesn't leak everywhere. After my primary care physician learned I had appendicitis and he didn't diagnose it. He retired within the month. It was probably coincidental. Comma it was probably coincidental. Alternatively, he fricked up so badly that he retired out of pure, unadulterated shame. We had a guy with a major aortic dissection one night. From the bedside ultrasound, he looked like he had already bled out. He had some chest pain, 
but he was alert and oriented, and we were shocked he was even still alive. He absolutely shouldn't have been with how much blood we saw and the size of the dissection. We called the surgeon in, who was really blunt, and explained to the guy he was probably going to die in surgery. He was a young guy, like late 40s. He was on a business trip, and it was completely unexpected. He kept trying to call his wife, but it was like 2am and she wasn't answering. He just wanted to talk and tell her goodbye. It was actually pretty devastating to watch. Meanwhile he's so coherent and alert as if he isn't actively bleeding out and dying. Most patients we would get in the same situation wouldn't be conscious or would already be dead. They swooped him off to surgery before he could contact his wife, and the dude lived. Remembering that story got me through a lot of tough years in the air. Because I think it just reminded me that hope and good outcomes are still out there. But to clarify some things, late 40s is young for this kind of case to happen. We usually see people dissect in their 70s to 90s. Also late 40s is a pretty young age to die, especially if you don't have any chronic illnesses. A couple of weeks ago, my ED lost a 30 year old to COVID-19. A couple of nurses cried because we consider people twice his age still pretty young. This happened when I was still a tech and had only been in the air for about a year. He was brought in by M's uncomfortable, but definitely awake and alert. His ECG was normal, and he didn't have any pertinent history, just chronic HTN and a few minor surgeries. But he was hypertensive and really pale, and when we performed in US, we found what looked like a huge volume of blood in the abdomen and a visible intimal tear. We pretty much immediately diagnosed him with AD and had vascular surgery in the room within a few minutes. I followed up on his chart a few days later and found out not only that he was alive, but he was already extubated and able to walk. I'll try to keep sorting through comments. I'm surprised that this isn't as uncommon as I thought. My favorite bit about this story is you called someone in their late 40s a young guy. As feel good as this story is. You've just made a bunch of other random people very happy. My mom's a doctor. I asked her about this when it came up on Reddit. When my mom was in her a cycle during internship, man with police officers behind him came in the air. The man was perfectly fine and walking. So my mom and her colleagues were confused. The officers showed them a picture of a crumpled metal piece, which was a car. It didn't look like a car at all, just metal trash. The officers told my mom and her colleagues that they rescued the patient from the car, which was lit on fire only a few seconds after they rescued him. The patient didn't have a single scar on him, was perfectly fine, and got his name around the hospital for being immortal. My siblings and I all walked away from a car crash where our hatchback flipped upside down and backwards on the highway. The car was totaled. Ambulance guys couldn't believe we'd walked out of it. Seatbelts save lives. My sister was the patient, but every doctor who's gone through her whole file has had this reaction. When when was 9 she fell around 35 feet off a bluff and landed head first on bedrock. Shattered every bone in her skull. A very well known neurosurgeon took a look at her when she was brought in, said sorry there is absolutely nothing I can do for her. I'd say she had a 10% chance of surviving the night, say your goodbyes now. 3 weeks in a coma, 3 months in an IQ, 6 months as an inpatient, she's still alive today. She has permanent damage of course, but holy cow can kids bodies recover from a lot. Yup, I got hit by a car when I was 4. The driver didn't see me run in front of her car. She knocked me down and kept going. I was dragged under the car and scraped on the pavement. So much so that half the hair on my head was torn off. Driver didn't stop until she ran over my shoulder. I was in a coma for 10 days. My dad is 87. He had prostate, liver, bowel, colon and skin cancer. For the skin cancer he had lots of reconstructive surgeries. His whole tibia region and the back of his hands. Every year he has to have at least one skin lesion removed. He had a couple of heart attacks and then a six-fold bypass surgery. He also had a big pneumonia, a huge abscess and a small stroke. His doctor wants to see him every six months. I think just to be amazed that he's still walking around. If I were a doctor or scientist frick every six months, I'd want to see this guy weekly so I could study him and give other people his immortality. I'm a psychologist, 
not an MD or do, but I work at a psychiatric hospital. Anyway, one of my patients a few weeks ago was a 15 year old boy who was regularly neglected as an infant by his mother who was an addict. When he was around 5 years old, his mom pimped him out to men for fricking in return for drugs. When he was 9, his stepfather gave him a skull fracture after beating him with a wrench. When he was 14, the same man shot him with a pistol for talking back. He's in foster care at the moment, and suffers from CPTSD and depression. But, he's the sweetest boy I ever met. I wish him the absolute best in life going forward. He deserves it. Something similar happened to my old boss nephew. She took custody of him from her drug addict sister. Poor kid was very sweet but I felt bad for him. We had one of these at an eye doctor's office of all places. Patient was complaining about how her new glasses weren't working. So the doctor took her in back to check to see if the prescription needed tweaking. The doctor came up with a completely different prescription. Patient was overweight but claimed she was not diabetic. The doctor convinced her to let us take a blood sugar measurement with a staff member's personal glucose meter. All the meter displayed was high. With some arguing, we were able to get her to go to the local hospital right away. I don't remember what her blood sugar level was, but I remember it was the hospital's high score for a while. She should not have been conscious let alone functioning normally. All the meter displayed was high. What a friendly meter. A guy, now passed away who had incurable lung cancer from Agent Orange exposure during infantry service in Vietnam and his wife had recently died. Cancer. Wife died. Guy was pretty positive glass half full about chemo considering the double whammy. Asked him how he managed to keep it on the positive. He said he was returning to base with just days left on his enlistment. Rookie pilot has a mechanical failure of some sorts in their Huey. They are going down, and not the controlled kind of landing either. He assumes he is about to die. Says everything got real slow. Real bright and a sense of acceptance and peace washed over him. Rookie pulls one out at the last moment. Lands their bird with no casualties. Patient told me he felt he should have died that day, and every single day since was a complete gift. Maybe being alive has a lot to do with attitude. I believe it my uncle survived 3 ambushes in Vietnam he's a real believer in faith and God because of it my dad was there to him not so much. I was in the military myself and deployed 2 times and I seen some combat and I guess it's how close you come and your outlook on life. My mother, we used to live in East Texas and my mom had this lady come in and had a huge infected wound in her leg, like massive to the point they might have to amputate and she had asked her why she waited so long before coming in when it was obviously festering. Well turns out this woman was letting her dogs lick it clean because their mouths are clean and she was soaking it in Dr. Pepper because doctor had her thinking it would help. Needless to say my mother looked at her like a deer in the headlights when she said that. Talked to my mother she also said there was a couple canine teeth in it because the lady had an old dog. My friend in nursing school was in charge of checking in and out a habitual patient that also was seen by a full nurse and doctor. On checkout she noticed a bandage on the guy. Oh that's for my hole the guy had an open saw that kept getting bigger and bigger and he had stuffed 3 t-shirt in it. He had been having repeated health problems and they just listened to his lungs. Would give him an antibiotic and streeting him. Yay. I've seen this before. Had a poor woman that had a wound on her back that was so bad, you could see her spine. I was so happy when she finally passed. Her family had been keeping her alive as long as possible to collect her social security checks. Obligatory not a doctor. I'm a funeral director and I received the body of a 90 something man. I could tell he had been sick for quite some time just by looking at his face. Another funeral director did the embalming. So I hadn't seen the rest of his body. Seeing that he was so old and just looked sick. I was surprised when I met with his daughter and she inquired about an autopsy. I asked her my usual questions and discovered that this man. For 40 plus years. Had unregulated diabetes. He was shot on 3 different occasions in his life. He had a history of strokes. Bed sores. Deep ones. In and out of the hospital for sepsis. Pneumonia. Heavy smoker. Heavier drinker. Suffered a major heart attack just days before. His vision was going and he couldn't keep himself awake. Horrible jaundice. Cirrhosis. Had an infected kidney removed. On and on. I don't think this man lived one healthy day in the last 20 years. I asked the daughter. So, you want an autopsy because? 
She tells me that her father was not an ill man and it was not his time to go. She's furious I even questioned her request. I'm baffled that this man lived for 90 plus years. The denial people can experience in hand with grief is astounding. I was expecting the guy to wake up at some point somehow. Two patients that give me faith in what medicine can do when I think about it, both quite young to be so sick. First was a woman who was very pregnant and some genius doc agreed to put her under twilight anesthesia for an elective procedure that definitely could have waited. Went into labor while she was under and from they had everything go wrong ended up in cardiac arrest. Was transported to my hospital and put on VAECMO. She was in rough shape when I saw her first. Most people in her condition don't make it. I ended up seeing her a month later walk into my OP clinic and I got the creepiest feeling. It was like seeing a ghost. She was fine. Not like most people who come out of the IQ after that kind of stay. The second was a young guy who bled out in the IQ of a sudden hemorrhage. He was pulseless for an hour. Without going into a bunch of details. He required several procedures after that which were risky on their own. It took weeks for him to reboot but eventually he was responding to stimuli. After a couple months he walked out of the hospital. He wasn't dying. He was dead for an hour. That these two survived is a testament to modern medical science. That they walked out of the hospital on their own, needing little to no assistance, and with their cognition completely intact. That is a miracle. I remembered another one that was pretty wild. This guy had very advanced cancer which had invaded the major blood vessels of his abdomen and chest. When they took him to surgery, his vena cava was involved and it sounds like it just unraveled. They were not ready for a major cardiothoracic procedure so they were just dumping blood products into him to keep him alive while they could get someone to repair this major vessel. I thought the op report had a typo because they said the estimated blood loss was 30L. I forget the breakdown but they had put hundreds of units of blood, liters and liters of crystalloids and plasma. It's about 6x the blood in a normal person. He was white as a sheet for weeks after this but he made it. Holy crap. Six large adults worth of blood. I wonder how many different people's blood ended up in him at one time. Quick calculations say it could have been 90 individuals donations worth. Give or take. I'm a hospital medic and my first serious trauma was a guy that got shot in the neck. Somehow it missed everything important and went right through. Minimal bleeding. No C-spine damage. Just a hole through his neck that didn't piece his esophagus. Trachea. Or any major vein or artery. Dude was just chilling in the room. And then two weeks ago we had a gunshot that would not have made it to the local trauma center. Hit his femoral vein but was still gushing blood. One nurse stuck her finger in the hole and it stopped the bleeding. And I found a second wound in his chest. No bleeding at all. It just looked like a weird indentation. We couldn't even tell it was a gunshot at first. And I stuck an IV adhesive sticker over it to vent it and prevent a collapsed lung. The guy's blood pressure was in the toilet and wasn't even able to read on the machine. We needed a manual check. By the time we got him sort of stable and with decent vitals, and got a surgery team in early, we were drenched in this guy's blood. Pretty sure most of what was flowing through him was saline and other people's blood. He survived though. We also had one woman whose entire abdomen was fully open under her belly, and everything in her was horribly infected. We basically told her we can't stop that much infection and she opted for hospice care. She was in so much pain I don't know how her family even got her to the air. I lifted up her gut to look underneath since I was the first in the room to assess, and I was hit one of the most rancid smells I've ever experienced. Literally everything from the waist up was infected. There were some unnatural fluids draining right out of the completely open bottom of her stomach. I mean it when I say you could just lift it up and look right inside. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video. Bye for now.